started tonight after one week off. I uh, I, cer I sure, certainly missed our farm in our last week. We were we intentionally had a week off, but uh, we're back at it now, and uh, we're happy to have you all here with us. Want to call attention to our viewer count in the bottom right corner of your screen. Uh, feel free to put in the radio button corresponding to the number of folks watching with you from your home connection tonight, uh, so we can report to our funders uh, the folks that are using this uh, service as well as putting your, uh, as I already mentioned, putting your name in the chat box and your email address so all can see who's coming in from all over the country. We are here tonight uh, because it is a big issue in Iowa and around the country uh, that there is a lot of turnover in, uh, in management of land. 42% of Iowa farmers say they will retire in the next five years, according to an Iowa Rural Life Poll conducted by Iowa State University back in 2010. And this is cer certainly the case in, uh, in, all, in all parts of the state, and we're seeing that in our membership of at Practical Farmers of Iowa like anywhere, anywhere else in Iowa. We can help, Practical Farmers of Iowa can help to ensure the success of the next generation. We do that in many different ways. Uh, farm and ours are just one of them. And we take it very seriously, this, this honor to work with such great, uh, great young folks and, and old folks alike, beginners of all ages. And uh, we're happy to, uh, to offer uh, many different ways of, of helping. And I'll go into those in a little bit. We are in the middle of our Fall Farm in our series towards the end now, really. And we've uh, been uh, honored to get to bring these to you with the support of the Beginning Farmer Rancher Development Program grant, which is a USDA-funded uh, grant, competitive grant, that we received on a three-year grant uh, back in 2010. So we will be bringing you these, uh, not just for the rest of the fall until the 27th of December, but next winter we have another lineup. Uh, this is coming at you, just finished this today, got everybody scheduled. So uh, look for us again in the winter for more learning from farmers, uh, again supported by the Beginning Farmer Rancher Development Program. Tonight's topic is on horticulture, and we have uh, really dived into horticulture uh, as far as our programming in the last uh, 10 years. We've really ramped it up uh, as far as our members have been requesting that. And so uh, we come together tonight with, with, with a known history of, uh, of working in this area in horticulture and bringing uh, horticulture farmers to share and network their ideas. We have over 40 farminars now. Uh, this is just one of those 40 available in our archive. So we have uh, been able to use this service, use this technology well, and we, uh, we hope that we can continue to provide uh, excellent uh, quality programming through this medium, as well as on-farm at our annual conference and, and workshops. The plan for tonight is we'll start with some intros, like I'm doing right now, and we'll send it over to the beginning farmer first, and then over to the experienced farmer to, to give some background and some, uh, and some details about where they're coming from, their experience and uh, their goals. And then we'll have a discussion based on some questions that the, the beginner, Ellen, has uh, to, to learn more about how to improve her farm with uh, low capital, inexpensive, uh, uh, but effective se season extension. Then we'll, we will conclude promptly at 8.30 p.m. Your questions are welcome throughout in the chat box, and we definitely encourage you to bring, bring your questions to the table, and we will enjoy the, the discussion that, that flows from that. So we're very, very glad to have your participation as well uh, for those in attendance. But do keep in mind that we want to make sure that the beginner gets to lead her questions first. Our organization is an open, supportive, and diverse one, uh, advancing profitable and, and importantly ecologically sound agriculture that enhances the community. We are a, a very great uh, network of folks of over 1,700 individuals around the state of Iowa with 100 members from outside of Iowa. So if you're from outside of Iowa tonight, it might be a really good uh, use of your funds to, to think about adding Practical Farmers of Iowa to your resources list. And as a paid member, you can get all the benefits of, of membership, including a quarterly newsletter, discounts to our annual conference, and more. But our network really is priceless. Uh, you can save hundreds and thousands of dollars uh, buying equipment in the right way by asking our network for, for their ideas and support before you invest. So our, our meager $45 donation uh, membership fee per year is uh, very affordable. You can join online. Our annual conference coming up this year is January 12th, 13th, and 14th. Uh, the 12th is a special day, an add-on day, focusing on Soils 101 with university soils professors teaching about the basics of soils. We also have a Friday night mixer 
available that's the 13th of January, Friday night mixer for beginning farmers to meet and greet with uh, beginning farmers from across the state. Register online by following the link on your screen by December 31st, and you can save some money. I wanted to throw some photos up here from our retreat we had last week. Great opportunity for beginners to share some ideas about their businesses and to learn together about business planning. Our, our networks provide friendship as well as uh, business uh, advice and counsel. Ability to come together and strategize solutions to challenging on-farm issues. We also have wonderful food purchased from our farmer members. We have really, really good food. <laughs> and uh, this is Nate Anderson here from Northwest Iowa. I see him tonight on the, on the, joining us on the farm and The retreat was a great success. We had uh, 30 farmers that, had, that were able to make it and learn from Richard Wiswall, an experienced farmer mentor from Vermont. And it was just a fantastic overnight retreat. And we're really glad to have everyone able to attend. So let's go, let's get, let's hit this farm in our run-in. Uh, we'll start with Ellen Walsh-Roseman on, in, on uh, effective and inexpensive season extension. And then we'll send it over to Rob for his introduction and to begin back and forth discussion with Ellen and you all in the audience. Ellen, if you can turn your mic on, I'll open up your slides here and we can get started. Okay, great. Um, I'm Ellen Walsh Roseman, and I'm originally from Northeast Iowa, and I'm a new transplant to Southwest Iowa. And my husband and I started uh, this, this summer the Pin Oak Place vegetable line of Roseman Family Farms. Uh, Roseman Family Farms, go to the next slide. Is um, we have about 700 acres of certified organic cropland. Um, we have a seven-year seven rotation of corn, soybeans, corn, soybeans, small grains, with pasture in there. Um, we have a certified organic beef and pork operation with 80 cows, uh, cow calf, and uh, 40 sows fair to fetch, and we sell those. Uh, direct market, off the farm, and through organic grain. Since I'm new to the family, I wanted to find my own little niche and how to fit into the old farming system. So I, um, Daniel and I got married in 2010. and. My first experience at the grocery store was disheartening. All that was available was iceberg lettuce from California. Not many options. Vegetables. So, vegetable business. Uh, Daniel and I own 73 acres, and we rent another 145. So that's included in the seven. We own our, own our own homestead, which is a quarter mile north of Boston. And just recently, we purchased two bread dairy goats. Next slide. Um, we wanted capital for our future. Uh, some we want to expand into some sort of value-added dairy operation. Um, and so we thought that. A low, sorry. Are you guys having problems hearing me? I'm sorry. Okay. Can you hear me? Uh, 
Um, I should back up here a little too. Um, Daniel and I both received agriculture um, degrees from Iowa State University and um, really fell in love with you know farming together. Um, and so our uh, plan is to um, do some sort of enterprise that has low capital investment and high return. So that's why the vegetable um, business is appealing for us because we'd like to um, in the future have a value added dairy operation. So we're using the capital um, and the income from this vegetable business for the dairy. Um, Uh, like I said earlier, when I moved to Harlan in 2010, um, after we got married, um, I heard a lot of folks were going to Omaha to Whole Foods to get vegetables. And um, kind of was a no-brainer that I should, maybe we should grow them. And um, I, the CSA was a great way to educate folks about fruits and vegetables and local foods. So we started a very small CSA. Um, with six uh, shares. Um, there were multiple families in some of the shares. And we were the first CSA in the county. So it was a lot of educational um, focus, teaching people what it means um, and how to cook with vegetables they're not used to, it, used to and uh, what it means to support local farmers. Um, we also sold our vegetables to area restaurants, um, Hy-Vee in Harlan, Wheatsfield Food Co-op in Ames, and some farmers markets and some other off the farm sales. Next slide, please. And uh, just looking into the future, um, we're going to continue the vegetable business and as well at the same time growing our dairy goat herd. Um, and so we hope in five years that we will have hopefully 50 CSA customers and then phase out some of the vegetable production. And um, we're this year, for instance, we're bringing in another, we're doing a, a collaborative CSA. So um, to expand more on that and grow some things for the collaborative CSA. Um, and then also sustain the current enterprises of Roseman Family Farms. So all the other operations like our meat, popcorn, grain business. Thank you. All right, let's, let's send it over to Rob then for his introduction, and then we'll come back to Ellen for questions led by her on what she wants to learn about uh, season extension. I see we have a question whether they're supposed to be seeing some slides or not, and yes, Kathy, there are some slides here. Um, they should be in the middle of the screen. I'm not sure what else to tell you about that other than there should be some slides to see. Uh, I'm Rob Fox with the Genuine Fox Farm. I assume you can hear me because I'm not seeing people frantically typing saying, I can't hear you, so I'm going to guess you're OK. And what I'd like to do is I'm just going to do one slide here. And this slide is basically a summary about what our farm is about. We are the Genuine Fox Farm. The last name is spelled F-A-U-X. And we are Irish, of all things. Uh, in any event, we love playing with genuine and fake. So we are the Genuine Fake Farm. We have a total of 14 acres. And we are located near Tripola, Iowa, which is sort of northeast, northeast of Waterloo Cedar Falls. And we are a zone 4B. So I noticed there are a number of people from other regions so you need to think about your zone in comparison to zone 4B. So if I give you any dates or any suggestions, you're going to have to adjust them to your own zone. Uh, we tend to sell most of our produce through our CSA, which is this year 100 members for the regular season. 
and we just gave our last fall CSA distribution to our 25 members today. So in fact, I'm presenting just about an hour after the last person picked up their produce for the end of the season. So I'm feeling kind of giddy that we are finished uh, for at least this year. We do some direct sales. We do some farmer's market. Um, we, we do uh, have organic certification through the Iowa Department of Agriculture and Land Stewardship. And we also raise turkeys, ducks, chickens. Uh, we have eggs, of course, that come along with some of the chickens for some reason. It's an amazing thing. You have chickens and suddenly you have eggs. Uh, in any event, we focus on sustainable methods. And we have a background where my wife has a PhD in social work. And I, of course, have a background such that I have a PhD in computer science, which makes it perfect for us to be uh, farmers. Uh, go figure, as far as that's concerned. And I really think what we're going to do is I'm going to suggest that uh, that is enough of an introduction from me, unless people want some specifics. And let's just get to a discussion and, and get started with the materials. Because as I was preparing for this, I began to realize that I could probably talk for three or four hours and uh, not cover everything. So let's just go ahead and get right to it and let Ellen ask some of her questions. OK. Can you hear me? Um, well, since I don't want to spend very much money, um, hence the reason for this farminar, um, a lot of things that I've read about season extension uh, tell me that I need to invest in a hoop house. Um, and that seems expensive for an enterprise we don't want to invest a lot of money into. I know it's only a couple thousand dollars, but a couple thousand dollars as a beginning farmer is a lot of money. So could you tell me if that's uh, necessary? And what are some other things I could be doing, like mulching um, I've read and covering things, what crops, et cetera? In other words, all of the above. Um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, well, let's, let me let be honest first and say that we did last season purchase our own high tunnel. But that doesn't necessarily mean you have to. I mean, we've been extending our season ever since we started at some level or another without the high tunnel. And uh, it, it really surprises me. Once we got the high tunnel, we actually focused even more on season extension in the field. And we're getting much, much better at extending the season. So you don't have to spend a whole lot of money. In fact, one of the rules for our farm is to take no loans out, and anything we purchase for the farm is cash basis. So I applaud you for trying to keep the expenses low. And you can do some amazing things with things like low tunnels, covers, different mulching approaches. Uh, in fact, I've got a, a, a pretty fair set of slides here that I can run you through that include most of those things. But let me put, uh, rest assured, you can do this without a whole lot of money. You don't need the high tunnel. OK, good to know. And yeah, we're trying to run our um, vegetable business cash only. Um, obviously, we have enough loans as it is, so we don't want to take any loans out for the vegetable business. Um, so yeah, if you wouldn't mind showing the slides about the mulching, especially, I'm really interested in that. Also, um, you know, season extension is one thing, but also starting, getting, being ahead, being first to market, um, starting my CSA earlier, um, that kind of thing too. Yeah, and something else to think about, you know, getting ahead of everybody, of course, when you're trying to make sales is, is one of your goals. But you also want to consider any dead spots that you might have, especially with the CSA. We've noticed uh, end of June, beginning of July for us, it feels like you're, you're not filling their, their shares as much as you want to. So in any event, you want to try looking at extending your season in all ways. OK. Um. 
Could you tell me what crops work really well for um, season extension or starting the season earlier? Yeah, you bet. Um, I think what I'm going to do, I'm going to go ahead and move on a slide here and run a couple and then I can get to some crops because that's just a couple slides down the way here. And I was just mentioning production lulls, uh, you know, periods in the growing season where you don't feel like you're getting a whole lot to work with and that's one of our season extension goals. And something that you might want to consider is it's not a magical thing where you want to just suddenly have produce for another month on either end of your normal growing season. Sometimes it's extending the season within that normal growing season for a certain crop, either forwards or backwards. Uh, and all of this we want to do without spending a whole lot of money. That's, that's been my assumption on all of these slides, so I'm trying to come up with things that don't have a whole lot of money involved. Uh, some things I, I think you should ask yourself, Ellen, and anybody else is, how much are you willing to do to actually extend your season? What are you willing to invest in terms of your time and your effort? Uh, Tammy and I both like to actually have some time in the winter where we're not giving people produce and we're not picking and selling and growing and weeding, you know, the, the normal run around, get it all done thing. It's nice to have a few uh, weeks in the winter where you're not doing anything. And if you extend your season, you start encroaching on that. Uh, I find I actually have a harder time getting all my fall stuff done now to put things to bed because I've extended my season into December. Um, some things that you know you can't do, you can't replace the sun unless you are going to spend lots of money on some things. And you can't necessarily mitigate all the weather conditions, so expect to lose things sometimes. You're going to take some gambles and you'll lose occasionally and occasionally you're going to win. And then the final thing I want you to keep in mind is the later or earlier you get in the season, the harder your work is going to be. I, I don't know how this happens, but Picking in December makes me more tired than picking in June, and I don't have to pick nearly as long. It just seems like it gets colder, you work harder, and get less done, and you're still every bit as tired as you were in the middle of the season. So I think what I'm going to do, if it makes sense to you, Ellen, I'm going to start with extending into the fall. Uh, we're particularly good at extending into the fall. Uh, partly because our soil is heavier here, so it has trouble drying out in the spring, so we can't always get into the fields. What you're seeing in this picture, if you look in the center, is those are some low tunnels, and we've had a fairly decent snow after those low tunnels. And what are inside those low tunnels is lettuce that is approximately two to two and a half inches tall, and our intention is for those, those lettuce to stay in those tunnels through the winter, pretty much staying about that size, and then they'll begin growing in March and we'll harvest them sometime in mid-April to mid-May. Uh, sometimes they'll come up sooner, sometimes they'll come up later, and uh, they do pretty darn well for us as long as those tunnels don't collapse on them. So this is just an example of a fairly simple way to extend your season and it actually results in an extension in the spring rather than an extension in the fall but you have to set this thing up in the fall to get it to happen. And when are you setting that up again? This was actually planted, uh, the, the lettuce themselves were, were put in seed trays about September 1, and we transplanted them about three weeks later into the ground. And then as it started getting colder, we covered them up. But the, the goal here is, whatever your zone is, is to make sure those lettuce are not very tall. They have to stay small, close to the ground, but they have to be in the ground long enough to get roots started so that they can, they can survive. Uh, the cover consists of six mil plastic, and there are some of these green hoops in there. They're, they're the commercial grade green hoops, but wire would probably work just as well. In fact, it has in the past. And the really nice thing about it is we had an ice storm soon after we put the plastic on there, and that pretty well held the plastic down in the wind. Once that ice covered it, we couldn't get in there if we wanted to. As far as lettuce bolting in the spring, you have to watch that. And what happens is, is as it starts getting warmer, we take the covers off. If you leave the covers on and that temperature in there gets too warm, your lettuce is going to bolt. So you start watching for any hinting of towering, is what we call it, 
and you pick that lettuce when it starts to hint that it wants to go. Uh, but for the most part, we're able to keep track of it, and if you get those covers off in time, they pretty much will not grow very fast because the temperatures aren't getting too warm yet. You just have to watch it when you get into the spring. But through the midwinter period, you just ignore it and just make sure that it doesn't collapse or it doesn't blow away in our case. Um, if it does collapse, if it's frozen shut, you probably can't do anything about it, so you just try to uh, limit the damage. Sure. All right, here's some fall crops for you. You were asking about this. This is what I actually was trying to get to. Uh, one of the things that I, I want to encourage everybody to remember is your storage crops. I'm not going to talk much about storage crops, but if you want to extend your season, especially into the fall, make sure you don't give away all your winter squash, your potatoes, you know, those kinds of things to your regular season CSA, or find a good way to store them. If you've got an old farmhouse with a cellar or whatever you need to do, you store some of these crops and you can extend your CSA season with those and then supplement them with greens and anything else you're able to grow. Uh, so don't ignore them. Uh, as far as root crops go, you can see that we've got a fairly nice list there. And in particular, the best fall crops for us have been the turnips and, and the rutabagas. And we also like the uh, fall radish. There are certain radishes, such as Misada rose. It's also known as the watermelon radish. That's great for the fall. Uh, some of the standard radish, you have to be careful to get them in and picked uh, before it gets too cold, because they do tend to uh, freeze off the top, and they don't have the quality. We've got a number of greens. We're particularly good with lettuce at our farm. Uh, the spinach is wonderful. We find ourselves picking spinach up until Christmas, and then we can pick spinach again starting, well, this last year, February 28, we picked spinach. So you can have spinach a fairly long time, and we find the spinach tastes sweeter if it's during the cold months that you actually pick it. Uh, another really good winner is the pak choy in the fall. It's pak choy, bok choy, whichever way you want to spell it or say it. It's an excellent fall crop. Once it gets started, it's really easy to grow and take care of. You can pick it small. You can pick it big. Uh, you just have to educate people how to eat it. That's always the issue with that one. And kale has been an excellent fall crop for us. That's one I particularly like and has been easier to teach people how to use than many of the others. Uh, so that's a pretty good set right there. And how are you, um, are you mulching the root crops and doing low tunnels with the greens, or how are you growing those? A little bit of everything as far as that goes. Um, let's see if I can move here. Uh, one of the things that I probably should mention, you know, the, the lettuce uh, is an example. Selecting those varieties can be important to you, and this might explain, I'm actually going to get to your question, but it'll explain why I'm getting there. The lettuce has different requirements as far as the cold. Uh, if you grow a head lettuce, it's going to be less tolerant of freezing, whereas if you grow a leaf lettuce, it can freeze and unfreeze multiple times and have good quality. So whether you cover something with a low tunnel or not sometimes depends on what kind of lettuce or what kind of crop you're growing. So in general, consider this. If you've got a green that has more of a solid core, and if it freezes, it's going to stay frozen, then you need to find a way to keep it a little bit warmer. If it's looser leaves, then it's going to be able to unfreeze faster whenever you have better weather. You can get away potentially with not covering that and extending your season into the fall. So there's a little bit to go on there. And as far as mulching is concerned, Ellen, one of the things that you need to consider about mulch is if you've got a uh, nice, dark, rich, black Iowa soil. When the sun comes out, that's a beautiful solar collector. And you don't want to cover that solar collector up if you can help it. Uh, so if it's greens, you're not going to mulch that for the fall because you will find that any, anything like that that has non-black mulch is going, to be, is going to freeze off and not come back. And if you want to do this low cost, you probably don't want to end up buying a bunch of black plastic or black mulch. Uh, so use the soil, because during this time of year, you're not going to get a whole lot of weed growth. And it's not going to hurt you to have the bare soil next to the greens. 
Something else to notice, you know, the red varieties are going to be a little bit redder in the, in the fall during the cold. Just something to notice because you, you might have to explain that to your CSA members that, hey, it's still that good lettuce you had before, it's just redder. Wanted to show you this picture. On the left is Amish deer tongue. It tends to have a fairly solid center. That doesn't mean that it's a head lettuce, but it's got a solid center. And on the right is Grandpa Admires, which is a, an heirloom lettuce as well. And it's got a looser center. And the Amish deer tongue, if they freeze multiple times, they have a harder time unfreezing. And when you pick them, you're going to have some issues down on the bottom of the plant. And those plants will not survive as late in the season. We have, on the other hand, been able to harvest the loose leaf Grandpa Admires as late as December 10. I see Ben's asking about spacing here. Uh, typically what we do is we plant beds that are too wide, basically as you see, two rows wide. And I, I hate to give you a non-specific answer, but approximately when you take your hand and make a fist and stick out the little finger and the thumb and punch them into the soil, that's about the space we have for our lettuce. We just kind of say, okay, there you go, about big enough. And it just so happens both Tammy and I have about the same size hands approximately. you know. Tammy says it's probably five, six inches, somewhere in there. And that's usually what we do. And a follow-up answer, Ben, on that is that we also tend to like to give uh, full-size lettuce heads. We don't do baby lettuce. We don't do uh, the mixed greens. In part, this is a labor-saving thought. It takes an awful lot of labor to, to pick the baby lettuce and the baby greens, both to pick them, keep them weeded, and to clean them up it's far easier to just pick a head and clean the head and, and distribute that head. So we like to at least get them to half size, half size, three quarter size, or full size when we distribute them. Uh, so that's kind of what we're looking at here. It's a good question. Uh, now this one I'm not going to spend a lot of time reading, but just with respect to the question about varieties, Ellen, I've got this here and I figure people can probably come back and take a look at the PowerPoint slide and see some of our notes about some of these particular lettuce varieties we grow. And you might notice that they are probably all heirloom or open pollinated varieties in our case. We don't grow uh, a lot of the more commercial varieties and that's one of our selling points. That's one of our marketing approaches. And if you're looking for really good cold weather, uh, the three on here that I really recommend are Bronze Arrowhead, Red Salad Bowl, and Gold Rush. Uh, they can handle the cold weather. Uh, I've actually picked Gold Rush and Red Salad Bowl as, as late as Christmas. And we, last spring, we were picking Red Salad Bowl, I think, some point in early April, late March. Uh, they're just a little bit quicker. And uh, back to the question about bolting, on the other hand, if you don't get the covers off a of Red Salad Bowl or Gold Rush, you're going to have bolted lettuce in a hurry. Uh, they do not respond to heat well. Here are some other things on the on planting. Uh, one of the things that we do a lot with, uh, talking about pak choy, for example, we seed them in trays about the end of July, maybe the beginning of August, and transplant them about four weeks later. And then they are typically ready to go. They can start getting picked uh, usually in October, and we can be picking those right up until about December. But pak choy does have a little bit more of a solid core, so you can't necessarily leave them out there for too much freezing. Uh, eventually, they're just going to decide they've had enough with you and say, if you're not picking me, I'm done. Uh, we do lettuce and trays throughout August and transplant them about well, two and a half to three weeks later. And the reason I say throughout August is we remember we're trying to plant so that we have Sometimes lettuce at different sizes, but we're also trying to plant lettuce that will overwinter. So we tend to continue to do our succession planting all the way through August with our lettuce. Uh, we do turnips mid-August with a direct seed. And we've tried later, and sometimes we succeed, and sometimes you don't get anything. Uh, that's one of the things we do is we figure seed is probably something we can afford to experiment with. And that's one of our cheap ways of trying things out, is we just say, well, let's try a little seed this date, a little bit that date, and see what works for us. Uh, 
So far, the fall radish seem to like August 20 through 25th for us in zone 4B. Uh, I tried an earlier planting. It didn't seem to like that. It tended to uh, not fruit. Just go all the tops. And after that, we didn't get them to germinate. So who knows? If we hit those dates, then we'll have a great crop, I guess. Uh, some of the others are here as well. Am I missing any crops anybody was curious about here so far? What about um, beets or carrots? Beets and carrots, yeah. Uh, as far as those things are concerned, both cases you want to be plant. I, we tend to do a direct planting of beets and carrots when we plant them. And the great thing about them is you can plant them sometimes in June depending on the variety. Now look for the, the days, to, uh, days to maturity as far as they're concerned because they have a wide range of them. And they will reach a certain point and when it starts getting cold they'll just simply store in the soil for you. So I don't play quite as much with late plantings with those as much as I get them up to a size in time for them to store in the field for me and I pull them when I'm ready to pull them. Uh, the nice thing about them too is they're storage crops potentially so if they get done too soon I pull them and I store them and I bring them out as a, as a root storage crop. So in some ways it's better not to get too fine with those crops because it's actually better to have the stored crop in hand than to have a crop in the field that isn't ready to go. Sure. Uh, at least that's the way I look at it. There are, there are other folks who are great with carrots and great with beets that do far more with those than I do because they like to have the, uh, the fresh beet greens, for example. And they, they do more with it, but I, I prefer the bird in the hand as far as that's concerned. Plus, you get pretty busy. And sometimes you just want something where you can actually get it done and have it in hand, and all you have to do is put it in the boxes and bring it. Uh, I see a question. There's a date for our first fall frost. We're usually looking at about September 20 as far as our first fall frost is concerned. Um, so that's, you know, not too bad. Bright lights chart. I see there's a mention of bright lights chart. Swiss chart is another one that I noticed I did not put out here, and it is one that we do. We have also noticed that the Swiss chard can overwinter if you do a little bit of protecting. Same thing with kale. So with Swiss chard and kale, you can have plants that you've harvested from in the fall, and if you protect them some over the winter, you will have some in the spring. Uh, the difference there, though, is that they will tend to bolt after a while. Once they've had their cold, they're going to be ready to set seed. So you can't expect to have them for too long, but by golly, you can have chard and you can have kale when nobody else does. And all you had to do is protect the plants that you planted for your fall planting. And uh, they should be able to come back for you. In particular, red Russian kale is a pretty good one. It's pretty hardy. I've got a couple pictures here. And I uh, just wanted you to see what they look like. This is a picture in, I believe this is about October 30, if I remember what I, when I took these. And this was a, a couple years ago. And the top left picture has some full size, well, three quarter size uh, romaine type lettuce. That's the red leaf there. And then there's a green romaine that's about half size. And both of which were big enough to pick and give to people at that time. The bottom frame has some radish that we needed to get out of the ground about then. And then the smaller things are, in fact, that is a very small lacinato kale. Um, and that is about the right size if you want to have a really good shot at overwintering. In fact, we did cover that with plastic. And you could overwinter and have those come back very strong. And if you have them that size, they're not going to be as likely to bolt on you. They're going to go through their adult period and extend that in the spring for a while. I see I've got a good question about soil temperatures and plastic removal over the winter. Uh, well, I'll tell you this much. During the winter time, as far as I'm concerned, in my zone and in my region, taking the plastic off is almost impossible. Uh, once we get the, the frost in the soil, 
and uh, it's it's going to have to take some pretty nasty warm weather uh, through December, through December, January, and February to get me to take the plastic off. It it might not even be able to happen. Uh, but once you get into March, then I'm starting to look fairly carefully at the temperatures in there, and I'm usually looking more at the the uh, the temperature under the plastic as far as the soil temperatures and I tend to run more by feel than actual four inch soil temperatures down so if you're asking for actual soil temperature numbers I kind of go out there and look at it and I and I have this weird thing in my head that says yep it's time to take the plastic off uh, so sorry to not give you a specific answer but I do go out there and say yeah we gotta get that plastic off or we're going to have things bolting and it's more of a feel thing uh, so sorry not to give you anything specific on that one. Ellen, here's your, here's your original question about mulching. And here it is again. This is a September 6, 2010 photo. And you'll notice down the middle there's some pak choy plants. There's some kale just to its left. There's some little kohlrabis you can barely see in the mulch. There's some lettuce in there. And if you look down the way, you'll notice we didn't mulch everything. And 2010 was a nasty, nasty year for us. We had way too much water. And we're in a very flat area with uh, thick soil. And we had a lot of water standing in our fields that year. So we lost a lot of our full season crops because they drowned. Uh, so as a result, two things happened. One is we had extra fields open. I guess that could be an opportunity. And two, we were able to mow all season long and get all kinds of uh, grass clippings. So we thought, okay, let's just do the right thing and mulch as much as we can. So we mulched about half of what we had. And here are the results we got. Uh, things that we picked before we started getting hard freezes were fine no matter where we grew them. And we noticed that they seemed to grow at about the same pace whether they were mulched or not until we got to about October 20th. And then things that were next to the open dark soil grew faster. And then when we got the hard freezes, everything that was in a mulched area that we hadn't already picked pretty much was finished. And things that were in the open soil areas were fine. You know, I mean, fine in that they froze and probably didn't like that much but they were able to continue to hold in the field for a while and we were able to pick them later. In fact, some of the things in this field we were picking at the beginning of November in the field with no cover. So there wasn't anything special we did other than put them in the field and of course nurture them, get them started, and then make sure that we didn't take away the, the soil solar collection that you're going to get from that dark soil. So if you've got anything that's, that's a greens-oriented thing, you probably don't want to mulch it. On the other hand, if it's a root-oriented thing, you probably do want to mulch it so you can get into that soil later on and be able to dig them out. So it depends on the crop and definitely don't want to be mulching the greens late in the year because you're going to end up losing them late or you have to force yourself to pick them before you get those hard freezes. Gosh, I said all that. Um, I was just worried about the mulching with um, grass. Did you have a weed problem? Hey, there's a good question. We, we always have weed problems. Uh, so, you know, that's a great question. Yes, when, <laughs> when you cut grass, you're going to have grass seed in there, and you're going to have grass seed that's going to take in the field. Uh, but I'll tell you, some of the, the long grass in many ways is a lot nicer than the foxtail or the pigweed or some of the other things that we have in our fields. The, the uh, uh, Canadian thistle, for example, kind of we have fun with that. So really, the, the grass mulch doesn't really bother me because it's not actually adding a weed that scares me, if that makes any sense. Sure. Yep. It's, a, it's a matter of what weeds scare you and what weeds do not. I've actually learned that dandelions, to me, aren't really much of a weed. They actually help me out more than they hurt me. So if there's dandelion seed in there and I have dandelions popping up early in the spring, they're aerating the soil for me, and that's cool. 
Uh, so I'll let them grow and they tend to uh, break up pretty quick when I want to till them in. So they don't bother me. And it's true of the lawn grass as well. Uh, so I'm, I'm not too worried about it. Now if they bother you, then you need to worry about it. But they don't bother me so much. What about so, like mulching with uh, leaves? Or mulching with leaves. Straw. I would probably prefer mulching with straw sooner than mulching with leaves uh, just because of the way leaves tend to pack down and sure. create a little bit of a, you know, I don't know how to explain it, but you know how leaves can really make a real packed down area. And the reason I probably wouldn't favor leaves in my soil is I have that thicker soil. And leaves do tend to, to uh, make things a little bit thicker and harder to work, so that would be a bad addition to my soil. But maybe yours is sandier and perhaps it would work better for you. Okay. So I wouldn't discount the idea of leaves, but I would also suggest that it's harder to keep them from packing down in a way that, that isn't necessarily going to make life easier for you later. Um, I see a nice suggestion about selling dandelion greens, and I agree, they have more vitamins than spinach, but you got to get people to pay you for them. I do agree for that. And there's also a comment about uh, tannins in leaves. Some of them are some that there are some leaves that are bad for the soil. Also agreed. Um, but in general, I wouldn't necessarily eliminate the idea of using leaves. You just need to know what trees you're getting them from. Okay. Now, I, I one of the nice things about this is Ellen asked, you know, gave me a preview of some questions that she was going to ask. So. If it looks like I'm a really good uh, expert where I can come off up, up with an answer from the top of my head, it's because I was hinted on what, what I was supposed to talk about. So now you know. <laughs> Here's a question about row covers. Um, in this case, this is Agrabon or Remay type cover that we're using here. And this is actually a picture in the spring, but it was the picture I had showing the use of Remay covers. So there you go. Uh, what we do with the remake covers is we have them available in the fall in particular because we use them as the emergency cover if we're going to have a frost or a freeze and we get those things out there as fast as we can when we know there's going to be a, a problem. As far as holding the row covers down, another good question. Uh, in this picture you'll notice we've got a fairly primitive method. If you look real careful there is a fence stake lying down on the end where we've kind of rolled it around there and then we have staples throughout the on the sides and then we also have more fence stakes holding down the sides. Uh, in this case um, we, we probably didn't do our best job with this. A better way of doing this is we use the stakes as initial cover. There's typically hoops underneath there, wire hoops every so often, approximately eight feet. And then what we found works pretty well is to put a stake on the end and have extra agribon on the end that you tie to that stake. And that prevents the ends from flopping open and going after it. Uh, it works pretty darn well. And we tend not to use agribon for much more anymore than the emergency cover. So sometimes we don't get too crazy with covering it. Uh, covering the edges to keep them from moving much because usually we take it off the next day. Uh, weight of Agrabon, the answer is it depends. Uh, we went for the middle weight because we tend to want to be using it ourselves more for the emergency cover than for the insect cover. Some people use it for an insect cover for squash plants in the spring to try and keep the various critters out of them and that would be a lighter weight cover and other people will use it as a more permanent cover and I've gone more to the the plastic for a more permanent cover in the fall so this is usually the emergency situation with the Agrabon cover for us. And it looks like people have talked about the leaves on the side here and I think we've got the answers there so that looks good. Here's a little bit more on covers. Uh, got the picture on the top again. I don't know why I put it there other than it's cool. 
Uh, but you'll notice on the right we've got some more Agrabon and then I have some homemade covers. In this case they're just uh, essentially two by twos with chicken wire but you can put something over top of these temporarily as well if you need to have an emergency cover or if you wanted to have something more permanent that works pretty well. Uh, the downside of this of course is even though we painted these they're only going to last you about four years before they start falling apart and the other problem with it is wind can get a hold of these and we've had them blow as much as 50 or 60 feet uh, at a time and it pretty well breaks them up and it's a bit more of an investment I think than just doing the Agrabond for example or hoops in plastic. And then down on the bottom left something you might want to consider too is the snow load where you're going to be doing your overwintering. You'll notice the one green hoop there is something I just put in the ground and there's another green hoop that looks pretty well crumpled down into the ground. Uh, that is what a drift can do to your tunnel if it covers the tunnel. So you need to make sure that anywhere you put these low tunnels for overwintering you don't get a lot of drifting and you notice there's a windbreak just just next to that so I should have known better. Uh, but that's what will happen to your tunnel if you have a drift on it and anything in that tunnel will be dead. That is just the way it is. Do we have anything else for the fall that anybody wants to ask? Uh, I could certainly go into the spring now but I'd like to know if uh, Ellen or anybody else has questions about fall. No, I, I don't have any questions about the fall. I'm mostly, I'm really interested with um, our operation is uh, the spring because I noticed this year, um, like my first CSA box, you know, hardly had anything in it. So I just kind of want to stay ahead. And that's, that's the way a lot of us, I think, feel uh, as far as spring is concerned. It, it's always, you have in the back of your head what it was like in September when you had those full boxes and lots of things to give to your CSA members. And then you come back in the spring and say, here's some spinach, here's some lettuce, here's some, you know, it, you don't feel like it's, it's what you really want to be giving them. So I understand exactly what you're saying. Uh, so here's a list of some spring crops that we try to focus on. And down at the bottom left, consider some perennial crops to help yourself out. If you can get some asparagus started, and by the way, as far as asparagus is concerned, we found that you can actually buy seed and fairly successfully start your own plants. And they're only going to be a year behind any of those the crowns that you can buy. And it'll save you a little bit of money in the end, I think. Uh, but if you can get some asparagus started, that helps with... Uh, some of the early stuff, rhubarb of course, and consider having some perennial herbs and spices. They can help bulk things out a little bit. You just have to be willing to explain to people how to use them. Uh, we've, we found that you can push beets and carrots pretty early. You just have to be willing to encourage people to try smaller roots, you know, smaller baby carrots for example. Uh, the asparagus seed we got from Johnny's uh, out of Maine and they do have one variety, I believe it's Jersey Night, that they are willing to sell seed and it works pretty well. We've had very high germination with that. Uh, crops that we also tend to get in the spring that, that uh, we like of course are the, the peas and the radish, but don't forget the scapes on garlic. If you plant garlic you're going to get those flower stems and those are an excellent source for garlic. For those who love garlic, you get them, you can get people hooked on scapes if you show them how to use them. And that really helps with your spring shares, especially June. Uh, different greens, spinach of course real early. Uh, you're going to need to plant a lot of row feet of spinach. Uh, arugula, you don't have to plant as many row feet because in the spring that stuff goes crazy. Uh, pak choy, you can you can try a variety of pak choy, but you have to watch it carefully because it can uh, it can bolt on you easily. <coughs> and things like kale and Swiss chard, again, if you if you have some of those in the fall, if you protect some plants, you can have them very early. But if you start some of those in trays, you can also have some fresh plants ready to go pretty early in the season. Oh, that was fun.
Uh, some overwintering crop stuff. We've had success with the lettuce started late and the spinach. We haven't even had to cover some years if we have snow. Chard and kale are good and we've also started some small leeks and small onions and put them in the ground. And I'm talking about just beyond the blade of grass stage in the winter and they will stay that size all winter long and you can end up with leeks and onions in your, your June shares if you overwinter those small plants. Uh, the variety of spinach we overwinter is Bloomsdale. It works extremely well for us. It just tends to not like the warmer weather at all, but it seems to love the cold. So we do pretty well with Bloomsdale. Uh, as far as the onions and the leeks in the fall, we were putting onions and leeks in the fall last year about mid to late September is when they went into the ground. And that gave them a little bit of time to get themselves established. We could get a little water to them and get them going. Uh, but what got us started on this, maybe some of you noticed this, we had extra onion plants and we threw them into the compost pile. Uh, and they overwintered and started sprouting the next spring. And we said, hmm, if they can do that when we don't do anything special, why don't we put a few in? And we had good success with that. Uh, so that's, that's one you should give a try to. Uh, we can't get broccoli and cabbage to make it through the winter. Arugula, collards, mustard all die off. Uh, but in each of those cases, you can start them fairly early in the spring and get new plants going. And we've tried to overwinter carrots, you know, get them to a certain size. But it seems like every time we do it, the plants look great in the spring. But when we pull them, we have borers. Uh, so if, if you've got borers in the crop, even though the, the carrots look good otherwise, uh, we ended up throwing them away. Here are a few dates here as far as overwintering crops. One of the neat things about overwintering is throughout the coldest part, you don't have to worry about watering them. You, you get them watered real good before you cover them. Usually we, we cover them and we get a nice rain and then we throw the cover over them and say, there we go. And they do pretty well with a low tunnel because the low tunnel doesn't exclude a really big area from getting rain or moisture. So even if you don't water them, you get snow melt around that and some of that gets into the area underneath the tunnel in addition to the area outside the tunnel. Whereas if you do a high tunnel, you have no choice. You have to water. Okay, here are some hints on spring to try and get things going faster. Uh, I don't know how much transplanting you do, Ellen, but if you can start working on uh, doing things with planting things in trays and then transplanting them out, you can get things in the ground a lot faster with a lot more of a jump. Uh, it just does take a little investment to get the trays, to get the, the soil. Uh, the seed starting, and of course your time. You're going to have to take care of those trays and make sure that there aren't any problems with them and that that does take time. But if you can do more transplanting, you can move things up on your grow list. Uh, read your, your catalog carefully. For example, a dark green bean seed will germinate better in cooler soil. So that's something to look at. Uh, here's a question about spinach needing above ground growth in the fall to overwinter. Uh, ben, the answer to that is, is I've never tried to, to intentionally plant seeds before the ground freezes for them to, for, for spinach for them to come up. Uh, but we've done that unintentionally and they do just fine. Uh, and by unintentionally that means that uh, we let some spinach go to seed once. <laughs> And uh, they did just fine the next spring. They went Actually, they went batty. So if you want to intentionally plant a row of spinach before the ground freezes, then I suspect you're going to be fine, but you may lose some of those seeds to predation. Uh, whereas if you get some plants started, it's more likely you'll get the success at least of those plants. Uh, some things to think about, too, is waiting on mulching. Uh, the soil solar gain thing you need to think about again. And down in the bottom right, we did a, a pepper mulch trial early in the season where some of our plants got mulch around the peppers and some did not. And the peppers that did not have mulch grew much faster and produced much earlier. 
and it's just a tribute to early in the season, you get a lot of heat from that nice dark soil that help your plants grow. So if you can wait on that, those natural mulches a little while, I know you need to get the mulch on there before things get out of hand, you'll get things going a little bit faster. Uh, are we using a seeder or hand sowing? Uh, Dan, I'm, I'm wondering, do you mean in the field or do you mean with the trays that we're planting into? And I'll wait for you to type that and I'll continue with the next thing. Uh, raised beds and row hills or hills, anytime you can, you can get a hill, the, those areas are going to have a slightly higher temperature, so that will help you a little bit. And then, of course, consider row covers on some things if you really want to warm things up a little bit. Okay, as far as seed crops like carrots, there's, there's Dan's uh, follow through here. Uh, we actually have hand seeders for the field. We're at the point now where we have just too much to do where hand seeding doesn't work. So we have an earthway seeder, for example, the, the typical earthway seeder for certain crops. We also got Johnny's six row seeder. And I will tell you the six row seeder from Johnny's when it works is a beautiful thing. But don't do it when you're tired at the end of the day or if it's about to rain or if you have any garbage in the field, uh, you get the idea. Basically, the six-row seeder can be beautiful, but you have to have a beautiful seed bed. You can't be tired and you have to be patient, but you can end up with something wonderful. And we picked up the European, the European push seeder as well. And the jury is out on that one. It's a little bit hard to change the, the seed plates. Um, but it, it looks like it could work some. So actually, if you're going to get one seeder and you and money's an issue, you get the Earthway seeder with the different plates, and that will be a very good investment for you. Transplanting spinach bread. Uh, well, we have had some trouble hitting the timing on transplanting them to the point that I just as soon put the seed in the soil and let them come up. It's one of the few few plants uh, for spring that I think would be just as well to just put them directly in the soil for us. If anybody's transplanted spinach successfully, I'd love to hear it, but uh, the couple times we've tried it were pretty uh, dismal failures. So uh, again, I'm willing to learn new things, but I'm trying so many other things too that sometimes I just say, well, that was so bad, I'm not going to try it again. Uh, Basically, what ended up happening is we probably lost about 70% of the plants we started in the trays, and that's not acceptable, and I would be just as happy to put the seed in the field and have 30% of them come up because there was less work involved. Uh, here's some pictures of some cold frames that we have. The top left has some of those cheap commercial cold frames, and I call them cheap for good reason. They cost you money, yes. Uh, but they typically only last at their full capability for one season. We were able to stretch them out for two seasons each. But what happens is that plastic cover starts to degrade as the season goes on. And they can become pretty good kites in the wind. So we've, we've had multiple times where, despite doing everything we could to hold those things down, we would find them across the farm or uh, against the barn or uh, who knows, you know. They would make great kites. If you want to put a string to them and a nice tail, you might be able to have some fun with them. But I wouldn't recommend buying anything like that. On the other hand, if you look in the bottom right, if you have access to some old salvageable lumber and somebody that you know is replacing their windows, then you can make yourself some very simple cold frames. And they work beautifully, and they're unlikely to blow away. Uh, now, the downside, of course, is if you've got glass, if something falls on them or you have a hailstorm, you're going to have glass everywhere. But I think I'm willing to take that risk versus the number of times we lost plants when things blew away. <coughs> and I see Sally says she's got zillions of windows, so she can probably supply everybody with all the windows they need for cold frames. So uh, don't, don't call her all at once. But nonetheless, this is a really good way to, to get your season started is have those cold frames out there. When can what you put the you plants into the cold frames? Yeah, go ahead, Ellen. What are you putting in your cold frames? Practically uh, everything. Even things that are 
things that are traditionally direct seeded? Well, that now there's a good question. Um, the first question is, is what is traditionally direct seeded? And then the second question is, actually, do I put them in the cold frames? Uh, the answer is, let, let me kind of back up and say, we use these cold frames pretty much entirely for plants that are in trays or plants that are in pots that have yet to be put into the ground. So we're not actually, we're not actually putting them directly in the soil where the cold frame is. Um, but we have everything in those cold frames from lettuce that we're going to transplant to uh, winter squash that we're going to transplant, cucumbers, tomatoes, peppers. Uh, every plant that we actually start in trays rotates into the cold frames. So in fact, I can show you the next part of the rotation or the first part of the rotation here. What we do is we have a series of shelves with grow lights and heat mats where we start our plants. And those are actually in the basement of our house primarily. We've got a couple in the garage. But really early in the season, we have these things down in the basement so we don't have anywhere we have to add extra heat to. It's, it's already our house. Uh, we are spending money on the electricity for the lights and the heat mats. Uh, but in the grand scheme of things, they're not terribly expensive things to buy. And you can build up slowly. Buy a couple heat mats, buy a couple lights, and away you go. Uh, the shelves we built from scrap lumber. And then what we start doing is we move them to the cold frames outside after that, and then they start going onto tables or carts uh, with no cover whatsoever. The picture on the bottom left are the are squash seedlings that are now outdoors. And we put them on carts or tables just in case we should have some bad weather come. Then we have this chance to move them inside quickly if something should come down the pipe. Uh, let's see, when can you put the plants out in the cold frames? It depends on the, the, the crop, Sonia. Uh, if it's lettuce, they can go out pretty darn early. And remember, lettuce can actually handle a freeze as long as it's not an extended period of time where they're freezing. And if it's something like, uh, say, winter squash, then you want to wait until you're pretty sure it's not going to get too cold out there. Uh, let me say that every crop has some specifics. And one of my favorite resources is the Johnny's catalog from Maine. If you don't get a catalog from Johnny's, even if you don't want to order seeds from them, get one. Because every single one of their, their crop types has an excellent description of the particulars of each crop. And it'll give you ideas about what te nighttime temperatures things need when they're seedlings, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So rather than trying to pull all those out by, uh, from my memory and actually maybe say one wrong, uh, that would be a good one. Uh, as far as I see Yeoman has, do you use soil heat tapes to start the transplants? Uh, basically, it's just the heat mats inside. And I don't do, you know, don't, don't do any heat in the cold frames. I'm relying on, on the solar gain from the glass. And I, I basically have them covered in the cold frame for a couple days. And then I start opening the cold frames. And then I move them out of the cold frames. And that's over a period of, say, a week to 10 days. Uh, I have never used a hot frame heated by compost. But that, that's an interesting thought. Uh, as you, far as, yeah, go ahead. Uh, well, this is just a kind of a silly question. But um, do you have any trouble with your, do you have a dog getting into the cold frame? <laughs> we, we have no dog that we own on the farm, but we occasionally get visits. Uh, and the dogs, usually we can control. The cats sometimes will decide that, a, a especially onions, are a really nice place to lie down. And then, of course, Tammy types uh, that toads get in and burrow in the trays. We have a lot of trouble with toads actually getting in and burrowing a hole. And it can be pretty, uh, um, well, what I can jump a long ways into the air if you're watering something or reaching down and one of the, the cells in a tray moves towards you. That, that can be uh, a little unnerving, shall we say. Uh, but generally speaking, dogs are not a problem for us. But if you think they might be, something you can consider doing is putting chicken wire over the top uh, so that when the, the windows are open, the chicken wire tries to prevent that from, from being a problem. 
At least that's a guess. I, I had uh, our puppy got in there and took all the tomatoes, a majority of them, and cabbages. <laughs> <Old frame. laughs> well, you know, every spring we basically tell ourselves there's at least one disaster. Yeah, there will be a disaster with seed starting, at least one, usually two or three. And sometimes we've threatened to just simply get it over with and kick a couple trays over or stomp on them or something. Uh, something is always going to happen. Uh, for example, we, we had uh, one of the lids blow loose from its tie down and it basically slammed down and we had all kinds of shards of glass that that cut up a particular variety of tomatoes that we were looking forward to growing. And yeah. maybe three of the plants survived because they were, they were shredded. Uh, so you just basically, you, you can't get too upset about it. You do what you can to prevent it. And then you have to shrug your shoulders and move on for all the plants that have survived. Uh, sure. As much as I hate it. I, I'm still a gardener at heart, Ellen. And as a gardener at heart, I want to save every single plant I've started. Mm -hmm. uh, but I've become more of a farmer where I realize sometimes you got to kill it. Yeah, that's right. And that, that's, some, that's a hard transition to make sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, I see, I, uh, is it Isla, I think, uh, put all trays on heat mats or just certain crops that need to be warmer. Uh, I would not, for example, put lettuce on heat mats. Uh, in fact, that could be a mistake because if you get the, the soil too warm for lettuce seed, you're going to find that they don't want to germinate the way you'd like them to. And that's part of what makes starting lettuce in the summer difficult is it's so warm. So we sometimes will take the, the trays of lettuce that we start in, say, early August. We will take those downstairs to the basement and turn the lights on, but no heat mats. And it's cooler down there. And we find we have much better germination than if we just start them uh, out. So we will take them down where it's slightly cooler. So that's a really good question, too. Now here's something that I kind of, do you have a calendar for planting that you'd be willing to sit, share from Sonia? Um, the answer, Sonia, is that the calendar is primarily either in my record books or in my head. So the answer is yes, I'd be willing to share it, but I would have to actually put it in some way for everybody to see it. So your asking is almost enough to make me think about doing that. So let me see if I can get around to that. Um, at some point here in the next few weeks since the CSA is now over. I can consider it. Uh, here's something on warm season crop extension. This part I really don't want to shortchange uh, because you need to consider getting your, your warm season crops to go a little bit longer than they do. And I wanted to illustrate this with a couple of points and this might encourage Ellen and others to, to just Look more carefully at the varieties you grow and see if you're growing, say you grow three pepper varieties. If they all have the same uh, days to maturity that happen on your farm, then you're not doing everything you need to do to extend your pepper season. So for example, here are varieties that we grow on our farm and the only hybrid on the list is Ace. Uh, the rest are heirloom varieties. Again, that's our signature. And you'll notice that we are able to get ace, after, this is days after transplant, into the field. So they've been in pots for a while here. After we put ace in the field, we can get our first peppers in 36 days, and our peak pick starts about 42 days later. And you'll notice I've broken the peppers down into six tiers, which means I can start picking peppers in July and have fresh peak peppers in September from the last two. So consider the range of cultivars you grow and see if you can extend your season that way. And try not to grow, for example, a whole bunch that fall in tier four. Because now they're all going to peak at the same time, they're all going to finish at the same time, and you didn't do what you could have done for your season. And you'll probably find yourself, say, in early September, the end of August, having too many peppers and no place for them to go. Now, if you've got a big contract for peppers with somebody where you've got a lot to sell at once, that might be a good thing. But if you're doing a CSA, then away you go. Yeoman's asking, does day length factor into the equation in any way? I'm assuming you're talking about the, the days to first pick on, on summer crops or something else. 
Uh, maybe you can clarify that. Oh, season ex extension in general. Okay. Uh, yeah, day length factors into the equation a fair amount. Uh, for example, I pretty much expect in the fall that all the growing that's going to happen for our fall crops will have happened by the end of October. And even that's even true if the weather is unseasonably warm. We just don't have the sunshine to encourage things to grow. We may have just enough sunshine, though, for them to continue to exist with some level of health and store in the field. So I kind of consider November and December as storage months in the field as opposed to growing months in the field. What growth you get out of those two months is going to be fairly small for us. So if you live further south or in a different zone, your day length may allow you to see growth later or earlier in the year. So yes, the day length has something to do with it. It also has something to do with trying to grow onions, for example. You need to have a day-neutral onion if you want to try and get them to grow uh, so that you have early onions, for example. If you've got a day-neutral onion, it'll work. If it's not day-neutral, it will not. That's a really good question. Now, Ellen, here's another thing I wanted to point out about the transplanting. The reason I'm, I, I'm sold on transplanting on many levels, one of which is the weed issue. If you can transplant, then they can manage to get ahead of the weeds. At least I can tell what are the plants I want to keep and the ones I don't. It also removes the thinning problem. I, I don't have enough labor to thin. So if I transplant, at least I put in as many as I want. But take a look at the advertised days to maturity that some of these peppers have. Tully sweet is 75 to 85. And yet, when we did transplanting, what we do is we put them in, in trays first, and then we transplant them to pots, uh, three or four inch pots. And then after a while, we put them in the ground. And we can get our peak pick starting 58 days after transplant. Now, that does not necessarily mean that these plants grow faster. What it means, though, is if I can get them into trays and into pots a little bit earlier, then they can be ready to go potentially earlier and actually get, get you fruit earlier in the season. Uh, one of the things we've noticed is that if you have a longer season pepper, these numbers don't seem to change so much. So the advertised days to maturity seems to be roughly what we get anyway. On the other hand, when it's an earlier to mid-ranged advertised, we, we tend to get things out there that, that uh, produce sooner after transplant. Uh, ben, we've got what size cells do you use for your different crops? Pretty much we use either the 60-count uh, or 72-count uh, uh, strips that we typically use. We don't go with the smaller ones, and that's another one of those um, Actually, that's a cost-saving thing for us in that we had an opportunity to get a whole bunch of those at an auction for far less than you should have paid. And so since that time, we've pretty much been stuck using those. Um, and they've worked well for us, so we've seen no reason to change from the 60 or 72 counts as far as that's concerned. And for plants like peppers, uh, eggplants, tomatoes, we go to the, the three and a half you know, three to four inch pots are all plenty fine as far as what we want to do. And the trick is, is we want to put those in the ground before the roots start to wrap around the pot. So if I can take them out of the pot and the soil block pretty much holds, and you can see some of the roots pushing on the outside but not many, you have hit transplant perfectly with the plants. Uh, as far as a recipe for a potting mix, we get our potting mix from beautiful land down in West Branch, Iowa. Um, it's just one of those things where I'm willing to pay some money for somebody else's expertise and labor. I don't have the time to make the potting mix myself. Here's another way to extend your season. Succession planning, don't forget it. We, we do summer squash and zucchini. We, we initially started with just uh, two plantings. We do an early planting and a late planting. And then we realize that if you miss one of the two, you're out half your crop. Or if you have a bad season, you know, bad part of the season, you're out half your crop. So we went to three. And we're actually going to settle with four, because the, the, the beginning and the ending 
um, successions are your gambles. And if you gamble, you don't want to gamble too much. And you want to have something coming up during part of the season when you're pretty sure you'll have success. So I do sometimes gamble with, with some early crop and late crops that, that if I have great weather, I hit the jackpot and I get a lot. You'll notice uh, for 2007 planting one, I had 7.5 summer squash per row foot, which is obscene for us. And that's because we made a gamble and won. Uh, but in 2008, we lost. It's just the way that goes sometimes. Uh, but in any event, we, we try to split the succession plantings up. You have a couple gambles on the edge and something in the middle that you know is going to work. And if you win at least one of those two gambles, you're ahead of the game. Uh, yes, and Sonia agrees with me. The, the soil block mixes and the potting mixes from Beautiful Land are, are pretty good. A lot of people also swear by Vermont compost as another uh, good provider for those kinds of materials. Uh, some things to consider. I, I think we've talked about most of these things, but um, one of the things you want to think about is, is uh, the role that timely irrigation can give you. Uh, your cucumber plants uh, will continue producing if you get them water when they need it, for example. And a lot of plants will continue producing if you keep them picked. If you fall behind on the picking, the plant is going to decide it's met its mission. You know, I produced the seed, I'm done, and it's going to quit producing. So if you can keep things picked, that helps. And uh, the bottom one is also important. You need to have a designated uh, taste tester in the family. If you're going to do season extension, there's possibilities that you will miss that something you're picking may look good, but it may taste lousy because it froze too much. So it, it helps to have somebody in the family who loves to taste this stuff to make sure you're not giving people something that really isn't that good. I tend to prefer my vegetables cooked in most cases, and Tammy tends to like them raw. So she's the designated taste tester. Uh, so if she says thumbs up, then it's good to go. If she says thumbs down, then we're done with that crop. It's not a bad thing to consider. Hey, look at that. We actually have a few minutes left. We have any other questions? Thank you so much, Rob. I um, wish that this would have been a couple months ago, so I would have got some things in the ground. <laughs> but it's OK. Well, you know, sometimes it's, it's good to think about these things in advance anyway. I mean, some of these, I would encourage you to just try, just see what happens. But sometimes I, I like to have some time to think about it. Uh, and, and see what I want to do and then give it a try. But then that's my personality type, too. I like to think about it and then do it. If Tammy were in charge, she'd just simply throw seed in the ground here, there, and everyone and see what would happen. And she'd probably be more successful than me. I don't know. We'll, we'll see. Um, and, and I see Yeoman says, what's my greatest failure and greatest victory in my farming? Well, let's see. Uh, greatest failure? Ah, oh, boy. What do I say? I'd say probably 2008 and 2010, Yeoman, we had a lot of, lot of rain and a lot of, a lot of plants drowned on us. And it was pretty hard to get through those two years. Uh, it's, our biggest failure so far has been just those two years. The greatest victory, though, might have to be 2010 when we had a great fall crop, where we just threw all our energy after losing most of our full season uh, vegetables and went wholeheartedly into the fall crops and had just monstrous fall crops. So that, that, might, that might run like that. Um, advantages of heirlooms, hybrids, and others? Well, we prefer the open pollinated and heirlooms ourselves. And this could be a whole presentation on itself. That's a really good question. Um, Kathy, I, this is the way I look at it. I have limited labor resources on the farm. So I want a plant that can actually fight some of the battle for me. And a lot of the hybrids are, are hybridized for commercial growers that use a lot of sprays, a lot of mulches. They have a lot of big equipment. It's meant for them. And they also tend to hybridize for big crops all at one time. And I want things spread out a bit more. So I prefer the open pollinators and the heirlooms because those plants are more competitive 
and they'll put up more of a fight with the weeds and they'll be able to handle a wider range of temperatures and conditions and they tolerate me far better than the hybrids do. Uh, a real good example is we grew early girl tomato hybrid and ran it against Wisconsin 55 which is an heirloom and that year in particular they basically produced exactly the same but the early girl decided to poop out on me a full three weeks earlier. So I kind of said, well, we'll do a few more tests after that, but in the end we just went all with, with hybrid tomatoes or uh, heirloom tomatoes after that. I see Sonny's got a question about fertilizing schedules changing with the extended seasons. Well, the answer to that is yes, because you have to, if you're going to put various fertilizers, and, and in our case we have poultry, for example, and we tend to use compost, uh, you have to abide by the application uh, prior to picking particular crops. I believe it's, we tend to go with 90 days prior, so it's going to change my schedule because I'm going to have crops earlier and later in the season. But it's just a matter of counting backwards and deciding when you're going to do which field. Uh, so it's really not that hard in the grand scheme of things. Um, Dan's asking about fruit and row covers. Uh, we're not doing any, any fruit in particular. Uh, we have some berries on the farm and, and things that we're not particularly cultivating. Uh, we have a few apple trees, but we're not really doing much with that. Okay, Kurt is asking about keeping the plastic on the high on the low tunnels. And Kurt, I hear you. This is a pain in in the rear. One of the things to consider when you space those low tunnels is you want to make sure that they're not too close to each other. There's not a crop downwind from them because if it lifts up on one side, it will basically beat the crop downwind to death. Uh, that's one of the things we've noticed. Uh, but I think probably one of the best solutions I have seen is have wire hoops underneath, put the cover over that, have extended areas on the ends and you tie those to a stake, and then take wire hoops and put them over the top next to the wire hoops that are underneath. And if you can, if you add your ground staples and whatever else after that, Kurt, I think you're going to be about as good as you can get in a windy area. Uh, so hopefully that will work. Kurt mentions the Johnny's hoop bender. I think you're in good, Kurt. I, I, go ahead and get a little bit more conduit and try the under-over approach, and I think you're going to have a better time. Um, oh, Sally's asking about the movable hoop house, so we have a couple minutes. We actually did end up buying a hoop house last year, and it was the only reason I was willing to do this is it, it's a movable hoop house, which means that each year we move it uh, essentially 90 feet west or 90 feet east. That way we are able to allow the soil and everything to rejuvenate in the open air when we're not growing things on it. And uh, it has been a big investment, but we're on track to actually pay off the investment uh, in two and a half years, which was our goal. So it's doing very well. We're, we're appreciating it. I can take one more question if you've got it. While the question's coming in, I'd like to thank our speaker, Rob Fox, for doing such a great job of pairing and uh, really, really thorough answers. That's just incredible, uh, valuable things to offer us, and I'm really grateful for you sharing that knowledge and for Ellen also to share your, your uh, real-life experiences and your, your questions that, where you're at. Thank you for your time and for being here with us. Um, while that question's still coming in, I guess I might invite everyone to attend the next week's session which is going to be on record keeping. And you could tell uh, during this talk that Rob is an excellent record keeper. And uh, if you want to learn more about record keeping with Linda Halley from uh, Garden of Egan's up in uh, Minnesota, she'll be on next week. And then the week following is another focus on season extension, this time on those high tunnels uh, that folks are talking about. Did I, did I take too much time? Is there one more question? Or if not, 8.30 is about with us. And I thank you all for being here. It's a great group of people. I enjoyed doing this, Luke. You can ask me to do it again. I, I think it's kind of fun. Hopefully I didn't uh, talk too much at you. 
Uh, thanks again. Um, learned a lot. I don't know very much about gardening, so a lot of the technical terms are kind of over my head, and but I think it's very practical knowledge. Thank you.